And our final presentation today uh, is going to be on Newton D. Baker and the creation of Cleveland College uh, with uh, Richard Basnick. Uh, Dick Basnick earned a BA from John Carroll University uh, and did his graduate work at John Carroll Case Western Reserve and University of Virginia. He currently directs the Institute for the Study of the University in Society and has been designated as University Historian at Case Western Reserve University. Please join me in our cleanup hitter today. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm batting cleanup, as Brian said, uh, and, and, um, and I'm standing between you and your dinner, so I, I'm gonna try to compress this. Um, so we've heard a lot about the life and times of Newton D. Baker. Um, we're gonna finish this with, by bringing it back home to Cleveland um, and look at his role in establishing one of the most remarkable educational I guess institutions in the history of this uh, this city, Cleveland College. Um, the the um, the state of higher education in the 1920s in Cleveland um, was uh, very different than what you see now. First of all, there had been the, the great migration uh, of of uh, people from Europe and 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 people from the South coming to Cleveland to work in factories. Uh, and increasingly to work, uh, work in offices as well. Um, and remember, at that time, most jobs in this region were concentrated in the downtown area. Um, the, the business and industrial sectors were pretty strong. Uh, they had gone through a rough time at the end of the First World War, uh, but the economy was reviving. Um, and as I said, most jobs were clustered in the center city, uh, and, and people generally walked to their jobs or took streetcars. Um, it was a much more centralized uh, sort of population. The only colleges in town um, in the 20s in the downtown area were, were Dyke College and Fenn College, both of which were highly specialized institutions. There was one other, and that was the medical school for Western Reserve University, which was still located downtown at that point. Uh, but the, the, the city was clamoring for, a, um, uh, for more of an educational presence. And uh, because of that, both Case and Western Reserve, located out here in University Circle, were considering something that came to be called the, 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 the enlarged university. Um, a vague term and intentionally vague to uh, mask the possibility that they might actually consolidate or God knows merge. Um, and uh, starting in 1919, the, the presidents of the two schools put together a joint committee to look, look at the possibilities. Uh, the committee worked for a few years, didn't get very far, and be became pretty discouraged. Um, but you'll see in a moment that there was a, there was a hero in the offing here. Um, Baker, uh, as we've heard, came out of the progressive movement, although he didn't buy into every la last piece, piece of that, uh, that philosophy. Um, he had a very good experience as Cleveland's mayor and, and had a great deal of support within the region because of that. Um, as Secretary of War, we've just been hearing a lot about that. Uh, you wouldn't think that being Secretary of War would prepare you to play a major role in education in Cleveland. Um, first of all, he had, as we've heard, had tremendous organizing skills. Uh, he was able to field approximately four million people uh, and, and, uh, and train them to, to fight the war. Uh, but he had also, but he looked beyond the mere, mere military training. He looked at the educational needs of these people. He, he had the, the military create something called the University of the American Expeditionary Force, which was a decentralized learning program that offered courses to soldiers ser serving in the US military in Europe and in this country. And they, they, they did that throughout the, throughout the First World War as a way of preparing soldiers for life after the war. Um, uh, 
the Baker was a progressive. He, he did very strongly support the notion of an orderly approach to, um, to meeting the needs of society. Uh, and he worried that sending millions of young men back home uh, following the war could lead to, to catastrophe or chaos or worse. And he wanted them to be educated. Uh, so he set up this program. Um, and that, you will see in a moment, began to translate pretty directly into uh, uh, his notion about Cleveland College. Um, also, one other part of the progressive movement that he strongly supported was this notion of, of private action for public good. Now, Cleveland at that time was a national model of this. And um, he believed that you did not need to turn to, to government to sol solve all issues, that, that, that private institutions could also do this. Uh, he was a trustee of, of Western Reserve University, and in that role, he had begun to suggest to Case and Western Reserve uh, about the turn of the 20th century that they ought to consider getting together. Uh, they smiled and um, uh, were nice to him, but they ignored his requests. Um, when he was mayor, he suggested it again. Uh, they ignored that. So finally in 1919, they got, they got the conversation going. Um, he also believed that education is a key to good citizenship, and in that sense, he's kind of a Jeffersonian. Um, now, how did he do all this? Um, first, as I said, he'd been urging the two schools to collaborate in various ways, um, and, and he was persistent in that, and he, he, and he engaged other people uh, to make the argument as well. But, but as a member of the board of Western Reserve, he was in a position to have some influence over at least that institution. Um, when the, when the 1919 initiative between the two schools faltered, uh, he went to the Cleveland Foundation, then pretty new, and asked them if they would put up funds to, to support a commission to look into the possibilities if the two schools were able to get together. Now, um, this wasn't a, um, the kind of a commission that was to sell a consolidation. This was a commission that literally researched the, the city's needs. What were the needs and opportunities of Cleveland that could be addressed by creating the enlarged university, meaning, meaning an institution that would have a complete range of programs within it that could address the various need, needs, uh, needs of people in the city. Um, at the same time, he, uh, he made sure to suggest to the Cleveland Foundation that part of the work of that commission uh, should be a look at the needs of adult students. Um, again, he's thinking about his former s soldiers and others um, who, were, who, who could play a very large role in the future economic growth of the city. Um, and so uh, you'll see shortly that, that when, the, uh, when the commission put out, put out its report and recommendations, a few years later, later in 1925, um, they really captured his thinking about what should happen. Um, he, he wound up chairing the board, board of Trustees of Cleveland College, which was founded um, with its own board. Uh, and he led the efforts to raise funds for Cleveland College when at the depths of the depression, they were experiencing severe difficulties he, he, he put up his own money and he went around town and sought, sought from funds from foundations and others um, to, support, to, to support the college. Um, so the, the report in the commission uh, reads that the university can be taken directly to the people in one or more downtown centers in order that no one no matter how humble his present occupation may be denied the opportunity to improve himself or herself while earning a living in some regular employment. That is almost a direct lift from Baker. So what was Cleveland College? Um, it was Cleveland's first 
uh, downtown college, comprehensive college, that focused completely on part-time and adult students. Uh, now, you might think, you know, as we sit here in 2015, it's not a big deal to have that sort of a program. Um, keep in mind, there were no state colleges or universities in Cleveland at that time, or in, or in Cuyahoga County, for, for that matter. Um, and um, college at that time was, for most students, defined as uh, the thing you go into straight out of high school. And it's full time, and it's, it's, um, it has all the normal fun and games of being a college student. Well, many of the students that Baker was concerned about were older, they were working, they were married, they had children. They didn't look like regular undergraduate students. Um, the college, when it was found, when it was announced in 2000, sorry, 1915, was initially a joint venture between Western Reserve University and Case, Case School of Applied Science, uh, which were seated, seated uh, side by side out here in University Circle. Um, it seemed like a good idea to both institutions. Case withdrew after a year as a as being in a joint venture, but they continued to make their faculty members available uh, to teach courses in the evening and make, make some of their laboratories available also. But it really became part of Western Reserve after that. Um, it, what was important to the two institutions and to their students was that the, this was a college downtown that would use the same academic standards that were enforced out here in University Circle. This was not a uh, lesser institution. Now, it didn't have all the campus life traditions that, that existed in University Circle, et cetera, but uh, these were people who were working, who had families, and they didn't have time for all that. Um, and this was a huge plus for the region's economy. Uh, it became a, a factor not only in populating firms that, that were located here, it was a factor in attracting firms to locate here because there was an institution that was dedicated to preparing students with the skills that were needed to work in those firms. Uh, now, uh, some pictures. Uh, John has shown you a, a picture of this building earlier, the, the building in the back, toward the back up there. Uh, th th this is a photograph from 1936, and the parade that you see in place there is for the, for the Great, Lakes Ex Great Lakes Exposition, part of which you can see um, back, back in the corner there. That's, that's the Sherwin-Williams band shell, which was part of the exposition. But th 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 this building right here is, it was the home of Cleveland College at that time. It was the Newton D. Baker building. Um, he, he was uh, so clearly the major figure in starting the college that they named the building for him. Uh, the building had previously been owned by, uh, by, the, Ch by the Cleveland Chamber of Commerce, but, but the college uh, first leased it and then bought it. Um, the, the, um, uh, the building uh, continued on, and in 1945, uh, looked this way, that there's no parade this time. This is the way things looked on most days in 1945 there. You, you'll notice that the students coming to and leaving the college don't look like, like, like the college students you see today. Uh, you don't see a lot of hats and coats and ties. Um, you, you usually see shoes, but uh, um, the, the, uh, uh, this, was a, this was a downtown campus, and these people were either coming from or going to work in many cases, and so it, was, it took on a very different tone. Um, the university br brought a man named C Caswell Ellis to Cleveland to run Cleveland College. Caswell Ellis came from Texas, interesting man. Um, he's shown here in the 1930s dictating to his secretary. 
He was gregarious, he was outspoken, unafraid to establish, to, to, to attack the established ways of doing things. Down in Texas, he had been the editor of a statewide newspaper that was set up uh, uh, to, to, to promote suffrage for women. Uh, and his wife was one of the state, statewide leaders in that program. Um, for, the, for the four or five years before he came to Cleveland to head up Cleveland College in 1926, he, uh, he had been the president of the Texas Nut Growers Association he had a varied background, shall we say. He came to Cleveland and um, he was a, um, uh, he was what the doctor ordered. He, he uh, uh, got to know the students immediately and bonded with them and, um, and felt he was very proud of the nature of the student body at Western Reserve College. This is, this is an excerpt from a speech he gave in 1929 talking about the students at the college. Um, and and we, we don't have a recording of him giving this speech, but I can just hear him as these bank presidents and bookkeepers and senior and junior business executives and clerks. Uh, he's talking about the contrast within the groups. Lawyers, doctors, journalists, chemists, engineers, poets, poets, artists, steel rollers, janitors, and university professors are all taking courses at Cleveland College. This was every man's college. Um, this is a chemistry lab at Cleveland College in the 1930s. So the, the college was more than textbooks and lectures. It was labs. It was very applied sorts of... Uh, courses as well. Uh, for some advanced laboratory courses, the students were taken out here to University Circle, to Western Reserve in case to use the laboratories here, which were more advanced. Um, if you look in the middle of this photograph, there, there's Dr. Ellis with his students. This is a class from 1929. Um, the, the, the commencements were usually held out here in University Circle because there wasn't an appropriate venue to do that downtown, apparently. Uh, and and he, was, uh, he would spend a lot of time with the graduates and their families. And families were important at Cleveland College at graduations because, again, these people had children, they had wives, they had husbands. And so here's, here's a 1937-38 uh, uh, gathering of graduates uh, with their children. Uh, and getting through a commencement at Cleveland College um, was, could be a time-consuming thing because uh, families would come up on the stage with the graduates and uh, pose for pictures and so forth. It, was, it would go on for quite a while. And the students kept coming. Here's a registration for the college in the 1940s. Um, now, 1932, we've talked a little bit about the, uh, about the presidential nomination in 1932. The, the students from Cleveland College came out to University Circle to participate in the mock, the mock political convention in 1932. And across the back of this large room, uh, you'll see si signs for Baker. Uh, the students were very strongly promoting him as a candidate. Um, the, 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 the posters and placards tend to play on his name, such as Baker, no more loafing, or Abel Baker, etc. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, this was a, one of the few situations in which the students from Cleveland College came out to University Circle to, to interact with the students on the main campus. Um, many of you who are familiar with Cleveland College or the university generally know about the book sale. Um, it started in 1946 and grew to be one of the major activities of Cleveland College, uh, but it is now continued by the Association for Continuing Education, which was originally the Cleveland, Cleveland College Women's League. Um, these sales generate annual contributions that, the, uh, uh, that, that are made to the university. Um, and by the way, this year is, uh, uh, if I can compress this, I'm not sure I can. Well, oops, yes, I can. Um, 
this year's uh, book sale, by the way, will be May 30th to June 2nd, and it will be in Adelbert Gym as usual for those of you who don't like to miss it. Um, this is a Cleveland College course in the 1960s. It's, it's an example, that this is a course in educational counseling, but it's an example of the courses that the college would offer um, that were designed to meet the educational needs of people in particular professions. Uh, and I think it's safe to say that uh, that was a pretty unusual thing, certainly for Western Reserve University. Um, Later on in the 1940s, the, the, the university's first courses in business were offered through Cleveland College. Uh, now, the college was enormously successful. In the years immediately following the, uh, well, the, the, uh, following the Second World War, because of the GI Bill, the, the, the enrollments in Cleveland College topped 12,000 which was more than the enrollments in all the other parts of the university combined. Um, and, um, and Cleveland College was just bursting at its seams. They were, they were using rented space in other office buildings, et cetera. So there was a plan to put up a new building on Public Square, and this, is, this was the drawing that was done of the building that would be, would be built, uh, and would again be named for Newton D. Baker, of course. Uh, but by the early 1950s, Western Reserve had another idea. And you've, you've seen a picture of this building before. That's, it's the Newton D. Baker building that was built in the 1950s at the corner of Adelbert and Euclid, out here in University Circle, uh, named Newton D. Baker, uh, as the new home of Cleveland College. Now, um, this building opened in 1957 paid for largely with the proceeds of the sale of the downtown building and gifts from, from alumni and others. Uh, but alumni and students at Cleveland College were not happy about this because the college had created an environment, a campus that uh, spoke directly to the needs and preferences of these married, older, working students. And they had great location, the, the hours were perfect, et cetera. And they did not enjoy the prospect of being pushed out in the university circle where they'd have to do battle with the, quote, children out here uh, who were running, running campus life. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the battle against this, which was ultimately not successful, um, he included a skit performed in 1953 about the shotgun marriage being forced by the, by the administration of, of Western Reserve University to force the college into this new location and university circle. Um, the, the college did move out to university circle uh, and it did, um, uh, it was, somewhat successful out here, but, but, the, but the student enrollments never rebounded to their prior size. But the, the college began to take on other activities. The, one of the major figures in the history of the college, college Grisella Shepard, who was the head of the general education division for the college, uh, starting in 1947, led the development of informal short courses to be held in members' homes. Um, this, uh, grew into a program known, known widely as Living Room Learning, um, a, a program that has hundreds of thousands of participants in this region and, and was copied in many other parts of the country as well. Um, this, is a, this, this is a course in the 1950s in philosophy, and I don't know exactly where the course was offered, but it... it um, um, the people seem to be very well dressed for a college course. Um, this program is now known as off-campus off, off studies. Um, so the college moved out to University Circle, but it still wanted to have a presence in downtown Cleveland. This is a, a storefront in the, the, the National City Bank building on Euclid Avenue at East 6th Street, uh, promoting the college in 1960, 
still trying to attract the students who are downtown working, although uh, getting from downtown out here and maybe finding a place to park uh, was a challenge. Uh, now, Cleveland College uh, began to decline uh, in the 1960s after the college moved out here. Uh, but it, it, I want to suggest that Cleveland College didn't decline simply because the market or the demand for education was moving in a new direction. Uh, but because the, the market or the, the, the educational enterprise finally caught up with where Cleveland College had been. Um, you also had the move, uh, the move of jobs and populations to the suburbs from downtown, the bulge of former students attending, uh, attending the support or uh, attending courses with support from the GI Bill was largely depleted. Um, and you had low priced competition from public institutions, Cleveland State in 64 and Tri-C in 63 that hadn't existed before that with much lower tuitions. Finally, the baby boom, which began to show up on, uh, on college and university campuses in 1964, tilted the, the focus of these institutions back toward, toward uh, full-time, normal age, if you will, um, students. Um, so population and jobs moved, I've covered these. Um, and then the college became completely absorbed into the university. Uh, in, in, uh, there, there, there were financial challenges here in the late 60s and the early 70s in, in, the, for, in the form of budget deficits, which were very severe. Um, in 1972, we had the creation of Western Reserve College incorporating Adelbert Mather and Cleveland Colleges, which of course was just known as Western Reserve College. Uh, but technically, Cleveland College continued to exist as part of that group. And then in 1992, we had the creation of the College of Arts and Sciences. And um, so we no, lo no longer, as of 1992, have any, any kind of entity here at the university known as Cleveland College. Um, what is the legacy of, of Baker today on this campus? We have the Association for Continuing Education, which as I said, continues to, to, uh, to, to work. And we have the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, which is a sponsor of this program today. And these are some of the programs that the Siegel, Siegel uh, program offers. Um, and let me close with this. This was a cover of Time Magazine in 1927, the first of two times Mr. Baker uh, graced the cover of the magazine. Um, while he was known mostly for his roles in civic, civic and national leadership and in the profession of law, he was a strong proponent of education. And the philosophy edu of education here, with one small update to modern language, uh, was at the heart of his efforts to found Cleveland College. He did say, the man who graduates today, etc. Uh, he was a person of his times, but in many ways he was, um, he was a little bit ahead of his time. Thank you very much, and if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them.